Hey everyone, so today we're going to do a quick talk on pediatric constipation, just uh, the basics. So first of all, we're going to talk about how to diagnose constipation. We'll talk about recognizing signs of an underlying disorder that's causing the constipation. And we'll talk about the treatment of constipation, both um, is as an outpatient and also as an inpatient. So first of all, as we all know, constipation is very common. So it affects 12% of children around the world in population-based studies. It can result from a variety of different causes, so congenital problems, metabolic disorders, medications. But the vast majority of children have functional constipation, so there's no underlying medical problem. Uh, a great reference are the or is the uh, evidence-based recommendations from the European and North American GI societies. Uh, so if you Google constipation guidelines children, this will be one of the first results that comes up. A lot of the information in this talk is from this. First, a quick case. Uh, so we have in clinic a four-year-old boy with constipation for the past year. He has bowel movements one to two times a week. He has large hard stools. He has lower abdominal pain with his bowel movements, and he has occasional leakage, leakage of liquid stool. So I think we all would agree that he has constipation, but how do we really make that diagnosis? You know, there are diagnostic criteria based on clinical uh, symptoms. And so from the Rome 4 diagnostic criteria, the, criteria, the diagnostic criteria for functional constipation are, so in the absence of an organic cause, two or more of the following criteria. So first is having two or fewer bowel movements per week. The second is having one or more episode of fecal incontinence per week. Um, a lot of times parents may have uh, maybe a little bit confused about why leakage of stool, liquid stool, what seems like diarrhea is a, um, why that's a consequence of constipation. So the Poo and You video on YouTube is a great resource for that. It kind of goes through why that is the case. The rest of the criteria, so stool withholding, painful hard balance, large caliber stools, and having a large amount of stool in the rectum on rectal exam. So what are things that would make us think about an organic cause, right? So not just functional constipation. So onset less than one month, we think about things like Hirschsprung's, anarch malformation, a spinal cord issue. If there's delayed passage of meconium, so especially if it's greater than 48 hours um, after birth, we think about Hirschsprung's disease. Although in reality, you know, even if they did pass meconium, Normally, there's still a possibility of Hirschsprung's disease. Um, if there's poor weight gain or growth, we worry about a, a disease like celiac disease or thyroid issues. If there's blood in the stool, we think about inflammatory bowel disease. If there are urinary tract symptoms, we also think about spinal cord issues because um, it may be shared innervation that's being affected. Um, Chronic intestinal suit obstruction, you know, a, a percentage of those patients will also have urinary issues. So if there's constipation, maybe distension, feeding intolerance, and urinary issues, that's one of the things that we would think about. So what do we look for on a physical exam? A big part of the exam is going to be ruling out signs of an organic cause. So we're looking for abnormal perianal or digital rectal exams, like the displaced anus or anal stenosis or an explosive stool after a digital rectal exam, maybe making you think about a non-relaxing anal sphincter that, like we see in Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, perianal disease might clue you into Crohn's disease. And lower extremity neuromuscular abnormalities, so that might make you think about um, spinal cord issues and an abnormal sacrum as well, so that can be associated with anorectal malformation. Do we really need to do a digital rectal exam? So. Yes, I think uh, everyone who can tolerate one, um, especially if it's a new patient and constipation is going on for a while, this can help identify an organic etiology. In one series of children, as many as 2% of kids um, had some kind of organic issue that was identified in digital rectal exam. It can help you determine if there's a fecal impaction in the rectum, and that can help guide your treatment. In one series, that was as high as uh, 50%. And um, it can also decrease abdominal imaging in the ED. So in one study, if uh, a child had a rectal exam, they were half as likely to get abdominal imaging during that encounter. Do we need to order any diagnostic tests? So first of all, constipation is a clinical diagnosis, right? The Rome criteria, all those things are clinical. 
Um, so no diagnostic tests are indicated for functional constipation, not to make the diagnosis. Um, testing may be needed, though, if there are signs of an organic cause. And I think in those scenarios, if, it's, if you're a primary care doctor, then that would maybe warrant referral to a GI doctor. What about abdominal x-rays? So first of all, um, there is no validated way to determine constipation based on an x-ray. People can't agree on whether there's a lot of stool or not. An abdominal x-ray in one study was actually associated with the return to the ED within three days and then finding an alternate diagnosis. So sometimes if there's stool in the x-ray, that might mislead people into thinking something like abdominal pain is caused by constipation when in reality there's another cause. However, if there's a lot of stool, especially in the rectum, that might affect how you treat them. So, you know, abdominal x-rays aren't needed for every child with constipation, but certainly it can sometimes be used to help uh, guide treatment. This is just an example of abdominal x-ray where there's clearly not a lot of stool there. This one, you know, there's stool throughout the colon. There's a larger amount of the rectum. Um, this is a child with a history of constipation. Here's another x-ray where there's, again, some stool scattered throughout the colon. This is a child who actually came to the ED and was diagnosed with constipation and had been treated with like 20 capsules of Miralax within the pat within the, a couple days prior, uh, but, then had, but then returned and then was uh, diagnosed with pancreatitis. So like we talked about, you know, just because they have some stool in the colon doesn't mean that's the cause of all their symptoms. How do we treat constipation? So obviously this differs by age. For infants, for young infants, um, you know, we're, we want to verify that formula is being mixed properly. Sometimes we can give some juice. Um, we can use glycerin suppositories as needed. For older infants, uh, we can consider a formula change. For older infants, uh, I'll often use uh, lactulose to try to soften stool. For older kids, we want to start by making sure there's not a fecal impaction, so like a buildup of stool at the bottom of the colon. What are some signs of that? So if they have infrequent bowel movements, if they have overflow, that kind of implies that there's stool built up in the rectum. If there's stool on the rectal exam, then obviously there's stool there. Um, or if you feel like a large mass of stool on the abdominal exam. So we gotta first, if that's there, we gotta first clean that out. And so how do we do that? Um, so there's various things we can do for toddlers. Sometimes we'll use a suppository or a saline enema for older kids. Uh, sometimes we'll start with a bisocodal suppository or a saline enema or a mineral oil enema to try to soften up that stool. Everyone differs a little bit in what they use, but this is the stuff that I usually use. And uh, bisocodal uh, enemas um, are also helpful too. After that though, we try to follow it up with an oral laxative regimen tailored to the patient based on a number of factors. Mild cases might respond just to Miralax. Um, moderate cases, we may need to combine a stool softener and a stimulant like Senna or Bisocodal. Um, these, are, these are kind of our uh, typical colonoscopy bowel preps that we use as a guideline when we think about what to do uh, for cleanouts at home uh, or potentially in the hospital. And I think, you know, the key after that is how do we maintain control? And that's really not just medications, but also education dietary changes potentially, so making sure there's adequate fiber, adequate hydration, we don't need to go excessive with that. Um, behavioral strategies, especially if there's like a history of withholding, like toileting schedules and tracking balance. But laxatives are definitely gonna, in most scenarios, play some role, at least temporarily, in trying to get this uh, constipation really treated. So maintenance therapy also kind of differs based on the person, but oftentimes we'll start with Miralax or polyethylene glycol 3350. And uh, there's some studies that show that it's um, not always necessarily better, but at least more tolerable than some of the alternatives. Um, sometimes we'll add a stimulant laxative or use a stimulant laxative as needed to trigger more regular balance, especially Senna. Visicodal comes in, in tablets, so it's hard for little kids to take. And then sometimes we'll use, you know, um, milk and magnesia, mineral oil. We'll oftentimes have to adjust doses until we find the perfect recipe to generate uh, like regular balance that are soft and easy to pass. The guidelines I mentioned before have a really nice table with uh, dose recommendations for a lot of those medications we talked about. Moving on to a more severe case, I'll kind of skim through this. So uh, we had a patient, teenager, constipation his whole life. He has a uh, mild autism, 
and he was having small daily bellments, but they were hard to control. It was really more like fecal incontinence, and once a month he'd have a large bellment. No pain, no nausea, no vomiting, but he did feel like there's something in his stomach. On exam, his vitals were fairly unremarkable, um, you know, especially given that he was, he was a little bit anxious, but appeared comfortable. And, uh, but he did have some abdominal distension and a firm uh, mass in his abdomen. And on x-ray, he had a tremendous amount of stool all throughout his abdomen, uh, really uh, an impressive amount of stool. And I think it's important to recognize that um, uh, fecal impactions and constipation can be a very serious problem and in some cases life-threatening. So you have a functional bowel obstruction there. Um, with enough stool, sometimes we'll see stercoral colitis or ulceration. People think it's because maybe there's compromised blood flow to the colon. Clonic perforation and peritonitis can result. Sometimes we'll have a uropathy because of all that stool obstructing the urinary tract. And if there's enough and it's pushing the, up on the diaphragm, we can sometimes have cardiopulmonary uh, issues as well. This is just another example. And uh, if you look at the image on the right and you look at the sacrum, you can see you know, how, how little space there is between the stool and the bone. So that tissue there, you can imagine there may be some vascular compromise there. So what are risk factors for, for fecal impactions? This is based on uh, some adult literature. So one is that if they're a child, and obviously that's all of our patients, if they had anatomical or neuromuscular issues, de developmental delay, certain medications, for us, you know, we'll oftentimes bring these patients uh, inpatient if they've, uh, you know, continue to have symptoms that are refractory to an outpatient clean out. And, um, you know, we'll first start with enemas. We may need a manual inspection in the OR if that's not successful. If it is, then they go straight to placing an NG and then running uh, go lightly to, to really flush out their colon. For that patient we talked about, his hospital course, so he, we did talk to surgery, had a disimpaction. He did respond to enemas, had an NG placed. And he responded well, was sent home uh, with Miralax and uh, Bizocodal. Um, but we did do a, oh, sorry about the typo. We did do an anal retinometry test. And this is normal where with balloon inflation, that band of pressure across that screen, uh, we, we are supposed to see drops in pressure that are corresponding to the internal anal sphincter. We call that a rectal anal inhibitory reflex. However, his case did not have any relaxation. That makes us worry about Hirschsprung's disease. So he did have a rectal biopsy, and it did uh, show that he had Hirschsprung's disease. So he then uh, needed surgery. So he had a laparoscopic biopsy of a sigmoid colon, found a ganglionic segment um, that the, the lower part was dissected out, and then he had a transanal pull-through resection and a uh, colaanal anastomosis. So in conclusion, constipation is common. We've got to pay attention to signs of an organic cause, but the vast majority will have functional constipation. Treatment often begins with fecal and disimpaction. So you can start to Miralax, but um, if there's a huge amount of stool in the rectum, that's going to be not effective. And maintenance therapy should include education, diet changes, behavioral tools, but also uh, the right laxative treatment. And we have to remember that we may have to adjust that over time. And like I mentioned before, the guidelines from the European and North American societies for pediatric GI are a great resource. So just Google Constipation Guidelines Children if you have any uh, questions. Thanks.